All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's Brad Hurst coming at you. It's uh, August 28th, uh, 2021. And uh, you've been watching the news just like I have been. It's been a very difficult time for us as Americans, and as believers. Uh, things are not looking very uh, good for believers in Afghanistan and across the Middle East. Uh, I wanna just <clears throat> read something here that I've gotten uh, off of uh, Newsmax. It comes to us from the ex-Afghan ambassador uh, of, um, of Afghanistan, and this was posted on 8-26-21. This is what he has to say. This is what he has to say uh, just as we are starting to pull out. The war is yet to come, all right? So he's, he's basically, his whole point is stating that, that uh, we're pulling out in order to avoid war, but he says the war is yet to come. The whole withdrawal announcement and process has been an enormous morale booster for the Islamic radicals everywhere, Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, Pakistani Taliban, you name it, they're on a roll and they know it. In fact, uh, on August 7th of this year, the what the, at the time was the UN ambassador uh, for Afghanistan to the UN made this statement. He said more than 10,000 foreign fighters are in the country representing 20 groups, including Al-Qaeda and ISIS, he told the UN Security Council. There is mounting evidence that the East Turkmenistan Islamic Movement, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan have pledged allegiance to ISIS, fought alongside the Taliban in portions of Afghanistan. I'm not gonna name these provinces and so forth, where they are currently present with their families under Taliban control, said this particular individual. So we have sort of kind of like a mixed bag. We got 20 different groups inside of Afghanistan and they all seem to be kind of unified together in the advance of, in their in advancement of their cause for jihad. In fact, we have people who are associated with ISIS who are working together with the Taliban in Uzbekistan and in Turkmenistan and also in Afghanistan. So there's a lot of confusion that's being sowed right now trying to give us the impression that there are all kinds of these factions out there and maybe the Taliban's the best to work with or what have you. And I think we need to start recognizing that these are all basically one giant beast, like we mentioned in our, our last video. They, they give the impression as though there's discord among them, but in reality, what they're doing is they're, they're working together. And now they have US military equipment and they're a uh, regional power, at least in the area where they're at right now. So. That's, you know, that's something to be concerned about and uh, we need to be watching. We don't want to get caught up in, you know, rapturism like people are doing. We want to make sure that we're uh, being sober and that we have a, a sober-minded approach to all of this. And I, I'm a firm believer that rapture will happen on the Feast of Trumpets. That's the, the day in the year that the Lord has actually set aside for that event. Whether it's this year or not, I, I don't think it's actually the case. I think there's some other things that have to take place. Um, in addition to the idea, to the uh, things I just read, it, it's um, it's interesting to note that uh, today, <clears throat> the very day that I'm actually doing this this video, there's a a meeting of eight Islamic states taking place inside of Baghdad, uh, together with uh, with France. In fact, the eight Islamic states are uh, Turkey, Jordan, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Uh, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and then also with France. And uh, noticeably missing are Lebanon and Syria. And the reason why these eight groups are getting together, or these eight regions are getting together uh, under, shall we say, the moderation of France, is because they want to, they, they, they recognize that, that there is a move for the, the West to pull out of the Middle East. And one of the things that they have recognized is that the reason why the West is there is to try to provide stability and for the economies of these regions and also for uh, military stability as well. So these, these nations, I mean, think about it, Iran, Iraq, and uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey getting together, trying to figure out some way to cooperate, to provide um, economic and uh, regional stability, all right? And this is actually being hosted by the state of Iraq or what was once known as, as Babylon. Something to watch here. Um, 
I do think it's it's interesting that this is actually taking place now, but uh, we need to keep our our eyes focused, our minds focused. We need to be watching. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't get caught up in rapturism like a lot of people get caught up in. And I, I'm, a, I'm a big rapture person. I think the rapture is a very important doctrine and has a sanctifying effect on us when we have a, a biblical perspective of the rapture. Um, there are a lot of events uh, taking place right now, and I think that we're beginning to see the beast rise. So um, uh, <clears throat> I think it's important for us to understand that, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, tell us that there are two things that we need to be watching for that would serve sort of as kind of like an announcement for the, for the ad advent of the rapture, and that is the, the great apostasy, the falling away. And I, I don't think there's any argument that that's, that's, that's underway. I mean, if it's, I don't know how, how complete that's going to be, but that is clearly underway when we see what's going on with, you know, these rock and roll pastors and these skinny jean pastors and all the sex scandals and the corruption and the, the Christian institutes and what have you. I mean, on a worldwide basis, we're seeing this take place. Uh, but in addition to that, there's also the statement that the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, must be revealed as well. So before the rapture can happen, the great apostasy must take place and the man of sin must be revealed. Now it is important that we understand where the Bible tells us to be looking for this man of sin. And the reason why I say this is important is because of, of a variety of different reasons, but there's one reason that I want actually, I want to draw attention to. Back in the 1980s, there was a lot of talk about Russia invading Israel. And, you know, it just seemed to be carte blanche. All the celebrity prophecy teachers and the seminaries and the big, you know, dispensational groups and what have you. It was, it was just considered to be axiomatic to prophecy that Russia was going to invade Israel. In fact, I, I, uh, I remember that. Uh, there was a time when I did think that, although for a very, very short period of time. But when I listened to some of the arguments, I remember just thinking, even as a young believer, these arguments are stupid. I mean, one of the arguments was, was that, you know, in the passage in the New American Standard Version and the NIV, when it talks about, you know, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, where it talks about, you know, the, the, the chief prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And, and I literally listened to seminary professors say that the word Russia and Rosh are very similar in sounding, and therefore, it's, my, it's quite possible that it's talking about Russia. Well, that, that, that was just an asinine argument, to be honest with you. I mean, that's just a stupid argument. In fact, the word Rosh is, is, shouldn't even be translated that way because the word Rosh means, it means chief, okay? And so I don't know why they, they did that in the American Standard Bible or why they did that in the NIV, but the bottom line is, is, that, that, is that is a bad translation that produced a very bad theology. Then when Russia fell, a lot of people were disillusioned. I just listened to a podcast this week by a, a, a guy who, who, um, <clears throat> Uh, was, is a seminary professor at Westminster, was a seminary professor at Se Westminster Theological Seminary and uh, taught it um, also at Fuller, which I, is a real strike against him. But uh, he, he talks about this, this disillusionment that he went through, you know, and he just had all this dispensational thinking and Russia this and Russia that. And then when it didn't happen, and then when Russia fell, he kind of went through this process of being disillusioned and wondering about the scriptures whatsoever. And so essentially what he did was he just changed the way he thought about the scriptures and specifically the way he thought about Bible prophecy and so forth. And to be honest with you, I'm not, I've listened to his podcast and it's, it's hard to make sense of what he's actually saying, but uh, he certainly has tossed out the, shall we say, the eschatological nature of the book of Revelation, Daniel and Ezekiel, and sees it more as a sort of like a life life living type of application of some sort or Christological in, in scope and looking back. So uh, I think that his I think that his first mistake was not as bad as the second mistake. So it's the reason why I say that is that folks when we we get this idea of what we think we're looking for in Bible prophecy and it doesn't turn out that way. And then what do we do is we we end up looking really dumb by staying with what we've always been taught or by basically throwing everything out the window altogether and just kind of uh, coming up with some sort of hodgepodge explanation for, you know, why why these things happen. You know, one of the things I find interesting is, is that 
when uh, uh, Augustine wrote his book, The City of God, back around 420 or so, 420, 27 or whatever, when he actually wrote that, it was actually done as a response to an event that had happened uh, in 410. You see, at that point in time, people thought that the, that the second advent was imminent and they thought that it was going to take place. They were sure of it. From their perspective, the world, the gospel had gone out to the world because, you know, for them, the known world had been reached by, by, um, by the gospel. You had emperors and governors and princes all converting to Christianity. Christianity was, was kind of like in vogue and what have you. And it just seemed inevitable that the second advent was going to take place. There was even an earthquake. There was a solar eclipse and what have you. Uh, there was a famine and, and with some all kinds of monkey business going on, uh, they determined that it was the 6,000th year. And a variety of things happened. And one of the things that, that I find to Augustine's credit was is that he was telling him, no, I, I don't think, I think he got this wrong. Then, then the Vandals came in and the Visigoths came in and they sacked Rome and the kingdom eventually fell. All right, Rome eventually fell. And there was an attempt to try to explain, you know, well, prophetically, what happened? We thought this was going to happen, but this is over here. And so uh, Augustine wrote his City of God, which basically um, had a different approach to looking at Bible prophecy that one that I don't think was actually very helpful. And they, they were simply just reacting out of, out of um, kind of a confusion of what happened because they had it in their head what they thought should happen although there was no real scriptural reason for it. So we want to make sure that when we're looking for that second sign in, in uh, uh, Second Thessalonians, uh, the second sign being the rise of the man of sin, man of lawlessness, we want to make sure that we are have a biblical perspective in mind. So I'm going to take a couple of, a bit of men, uh, a few minutes here just to look at a couple passages. And I think that these passages are going to help us to direct our attention to where we should be looking for this guy. Um, I think with a lot of things that are going on right now, specifically in the Middle East, and what we see going on with Islam, I think that there's a good reason to think that we could be on the precipice of, of maybe this guy showing up and the man of sin being revealed, and then we can start, you know, focusing more on the rapture. So if you be with me, just uh, stay with me for just a moment here. I'm going to look at uh, Isaiah chapter 14. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to read the, uh, the relevant sections here. This is Isaiah 14, and uh, uh, it says this starting in verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 14. It says, That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. Who has smote the people in wrath with a continued stroke? He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hinders. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirs up the dead. For thee, even all the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say, Art thou become weak as we? Art thou become like one of us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy voils. The worm is spread over thee and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now remember, they're talking about the king of Babylon here, but he says that in, in the first person, how thou art fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how thou art cut down to the ground, which did its weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will send unto heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that, listen to this, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? And if you continue to read on, even though 
in the opening passage, it says it's actually a proverb against the king of Babylon. They also go on to refer to him as being the Assyrian. This, this is a passage that is clearly equating a, a earthly person with Satan himself. And that there's a connection between Satan and this person with regard to shaking the nations and that this person will eventually be judged and brought down and cast down and cast into hell. So this is a, a um, passage that, that gives us an indication of where we might want to look for a, a person who might at some point in time be Satan incarnate in flesh. And it quite possibly would be uh, talking about um, the place of, uh, of Babylon and, and, and Syria. But I want to look at another place as well. All right, I want to look in I want to look in Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight. I think is very helpful. In fact, this is a very very key passage right here. It helps us to direct our, our attention to where we should be looking. Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight. And it's, this is if you know the passage, it's talking about the king of of Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. All right. It says the word of the Lord came again unto me, son of man, saying unto the prince of Tyrus. Thus says the Lord, because thine heart is lifted up, and listen to this, because thy heart is lifted up and has said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. We're going to go back to that. Yet thou art a man and not God. Thou set thy heart, excuse me, he says, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thy heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. And by thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches. And thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because thou hast set thy heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations. All right. The terrible, and this is terrible in war. <laughs> okay, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be brought, that shall be a man, and no God. In thy hand, in the hand of them that slays thee, thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, says the Lord. Now, what I, I think it's interesting is, is that, is that um, when it talks about the seas, it says that this person he he calls himself God, and he he uh, he he takes his seat in the seat of God. In the midst of the seas. Now, a lot of people want to say this is talking about the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea, and that Jerusalem is located in between them. And well, it's not exactly in between them, but I, I can understand how somebody might reason that way. But I think it's more specific. All right. The word seas there is in the plural, and it's talking about a, a multiplicity of seas. And what is interesting about this is that is that uh, in the temple. One of the things that you notice in 1 Kings chapter 7, uh, verses 23 through 44, and 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 4, verses 2 through 15, the Brazen Laver um, was known as the Molten Sea or the Brazen Sea. In fact, the word sea in the Ezekiel passage, when you look it up, you can look it up in your Strongs, you can look it up in, in, Blue, <clears throat> in Blue Letter Bible uh, on, online. The, the word sea there, is it's often translated as, as a big wash basin. And what is interesting is, is right in the middle of the temple complex, there was a brazen sea that the, that the priests used to wash themselves. But we find out, find out elsewhere in the construction of Solomon's uh, temple, there were other wash basins that were on carts on wheels that have cherubim, seraphim, uh, eagles, and face of man on all sides of it. And there was a wash basin over the top of it. And those were also called seas. And there were five, five on one side of the temple, five on the other. And the purpose of those wash basins was to wash the sacrifices to make them ceremonially clean 
to be offered up for sacrifice and the, the brazen laver or the brazen sea was for the washing of the priests in order to make them, in order to make them acceptable you know, for priestly service. And these seas are on both sides of the temple on the outside and the temple was right in the midst of it. And I, and I believe that, that what he's talking about here when he says that, that, that he sits in the seat of God in the midst of the seas and he's declaring himself to be God, calling himself a God, I believe that he is actually sitting in the temple and he's calling himself God. Now, when you look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, I believe that Paul is actually referring to this passage. When it says that, and if I get to this here real quick, when it says that, that regarding uh, the man of sin, it says that he's actually, he's the one who sits in the temple showing himself as God, exalting himself as God or above everything that is actually called God. What do you see here? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, <clears throat> regarding the man of sin, he says that um, he says that he uh, that this man of sin opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, when it says showing himself, is that basically he's revealing to himself and showing himself and putting him, he's putting forth himself that he's God, but he's also convincing himself that he's God. That's why it says in Ezekiel that, that he says, you have said in your heart that I am God. You set yourself as, not only did you set yourself up as a God, you set yourself up as, as God by, by saying in your heart that I'm God. And what Paul is referring back to this guy, I don't see how, to be honest with you, I don't see how I miss this. I don't see how we miss this. And we get these ideas that this is something that takes place in the past. But the bottom line is that there's never a time in the past when the king of Tyre ever sat, in the, even in Jerusalem, much less the, the, the seat of God between the, you know, the wash basins and the temple of God and declared himself to be God. There's not, a, there's not an incident with that like that whatsoever. Now, you compare this, what you see in, in the Isaiah passage, this person in Isaiah, the king of Babylon, the Assyrian, who's apparently Satan incarnate in the flesh, he's called a Babylonian. But here in the Ezekiel passage, he's called the king of Tyre and Sidon, and he takes his position in the, in the seat of God, declaring himself to be God. And then when you look in the Isaiah chapter 29 passage, you can see who's actually behind this. It's actually Satan himself who's behind this. But this is entire. This is in Sidon. This is Lebanon. Okay. The Isaiah passage is Babylon. So we want to be careful, folks, that we, we want to try to find somebody in France or somebody, you know, in Washington, D.C. or a pope or something like that. These passages are telling us that, that, that the person who's, who's associated with being Satan manifest in the flesh, Satan incarnate, that he's associated with, with Babylon, a place that the Catholic Church never had any impact in, and also with, with Lebanon, a place that the Catholic Church scantily, if ever, had any impact in. Okay, so Isaiah and Ezekiel tell us we should be looking to the Middle East. And specifically, Ezekiel seems to be indicating to us that this is a person who, who has some sort of association with, with Lebanon, all right? It doesn't mean that he originates from Lebanon. It just means at some point in time, uh, he's going to be not only uh, in power over Lebanon, but according to the Isaiah passage, he'll also be in power over, over um, the old, old areas of Baghdad or the old areas of, of Babylon. So... Let's just make sure that we, we bring, bring our minds into conformity with the scriptures and let the scriptures dictate how we're going to think eschatologically and not the, not the celebrity pastors, okay? Not the celebrity Bible prophecy teachers, okay? That's how we ended up with these people being disillusioned back in the 1980s because they're trying to sell books, all right? We're trying to, we're trying to be as broad in mind as, as the Bible is and we want to make sure that we, we stay that way. So, um, We'll keep our, keep our eyes peeled on to what's going on in the Middle East. If there's other developments in uh, 
uh, with regard to uh, Israel, and there are developments, I just don't have time for it, uh, we'll, we'll address those. And if there are developments with regard to the great apostasy, and there are developments of that, it just happens to be that right now, uh, pressing us are, is, is, is the geopolitical struggle taking place in the Middle East. And uh, it's quite possible that we might actually see the man of sin right up, rise out of this. I'm certainly going to be looking towards the Middle East. Ezekiel tells me to look there. And uh, also, uh, uh, Isaiah tells me to look there. Paul quotes Ezekiel, says this is the man of sin. So why would we be looking anywhere else? So, uh, all right. So I've taken too much time. I, I tried to get this video out a little bit earlier today, but uh, I'm trying not to rush through things. I know I've given you guys a lot. A lot of stuff going on, okay? We need you guys to be engaged and we need you to, to be doing your research and, and looking and, and so forth. And, and ladies and gentlemen, we need to make sure we bring our mind in, into conformity with the scriptures. All right, um, that's it for now. Until next time, have a good day.